So first of all, we're talking of nanopharmaceuticals. What are they? Well, pharmaceuticals, as, all, as you all know, are nothing else than drugs. Drugs that are formulated at the nanoscale. And drugs that, being formulated at that scale, have superior properties. Now, you ask yourself, what is that nanodimension, nanoscale? Well, if I say to you, it's a billionth of a meter, I don't know if that helps you a lot in seeing that nanoscale. But if I tell you that your hair, its diameter is about 18,000, 80,000 nanometers, and we're talking here of nanoformulations of around a few hundreds of nanometers, you probably get a clearer picture or a clearer view of what, of what the nanoscale is. Now, all the nanoformulations I've been talking are, in fact, nanocarriers. And when we talk of nanocarriers, we're here talking of very tiny particles that will circulate long time in your body, and they will target the diseased sites much better than the conventional drugs will do. So, what will happen? Your nanoparticles circulate into your body, they target the disease site. This means that you have got nanoparticles with better efficacy and also with reduced toxicity. So, two main important, uh, uh, two important characteristics of uh, those nanoparticles. Now, the two coupled together will lead to more cost effectiveness. Now, this cost effectiveness is not something that you will acquire in the short term. It will be something that you will get in the medium to long term. And a recent uh, Chinese study shows that the uh, use of nanopharmaceuticals indeed is cost-effective in the medium and long term. Now, people may think that nanopharmaceuticals, well, is just a researcher's curiosity. Not at all. You have more than 50 nanoformulations on the market right now. And as you can see on this slide, I've shown to you one of the blockbuster nanoformulations, which is Abraxane. And this is nothing else than a formulation of paclitaxel, an anti-cancer drug, into a human albumin. And you get the human albumin that transports your cancer drug into your body and gets it more, uh, uh, better, better efficacy. Now, this was approved in 2005. In 2013, we've got combinations of this nanoformulation with a conventional free drug, with, which is gemcitabine. And this combination leads to very good results when administered into the body to combat advanced pancreatic cancer. And this has been approved in 2013. So you can see on this slide, you can see that we've got, after only six weeks, partial remission of the cancer. That's a very good point. We, we also find that half of the drugs, nanoformulated drugs on the market, are for cancer treatment. And when you look at Mauritius, and you find that 2,400 new cases of cancer each year, breast cancer, prostate cancer, you find that we cannot neglect nanopharmaceuticals. Now, you see here, you've got normal cells. You see the nanopharmaceuticals in the bloodstream. And what you can find is nanopharmaceuticals move into the bloodstream, and as I said earlier, they spend a long time into, into, into circulation, but will not cross and go to the normal cells. Now, if you take those cancer cells, what happens? You've got your nanoparticles circulating. Now, at the vicinity of the cancer cells, 
you have what we call, here it's written, increased vasculature. Now, increased vasculature means that nanoparticles can cross the endothelial membrane and get into the cancer cells. And because in the vicinity of the cancer cells, we have what we call poor lymphatic drainage, what happens is that the nanoparticles get accumulated in the vicinity of the cancer cells, and by a mechanism that we call endocytosis, they're able to get into the cancer cells. Now, they accumulate there, and it is into the cancer cells that they're going to release their drugs. So this is how they get to be better and more efficient. Now, what is our idea? How do we move from there? A lot of people are working in this area. We thought that, simply, if we take two or more drugs, put them into nanoformulations, and eventually play with those nanoformulations, combining them and so on, we might achieve some enhanced toxicity. That is, we might kill more cancer cells. This is the primary idea. So, at the end of the day, it's not the researcher that is important or the work that he's doing, but at the end of the, of the day, it's the patients that are the most important. We are working for, to enhance patient survival or simply to cure that major problem. So, what does it entail? We've got, in the first instance, to go to the lab and get those nanoparticles. We got to design them. We got to prepare them, synthesize them. So we, get, we need to get the matter, right? Once you get the nanoparticles, you need to make sure that you can put drugs in them. And you can put enough amount of drugs into those nanoparticles. Once you put drugs inside, the next point is to ensure that you can release the drugs in a sustained manner, means over extended period of times. Well, once you have put in drugs, you have released drugs, the next step is to ensure that, indeed, you can have enhanced toxicity, because drugs can be released, but not at the place where you want them to be released. And so you need to ensure that they have, indeed, enhanced toxicity. So take, try to take you through what we've done, and uh, in, as, as simple as possible, I uh, hope so. And in fact, when we started that work, we chose to work on what we call a special type of nanoformulation that we term, or we call nanomycels, not us only, but the, whole, the old people working in this area uh, call this nanomycels. You've heard of mycels. You use soap every day. So a soap is a mycel, right? And we engineer those kind of mycels. Now, you can find here a scheme of a micelle. What it consists of is you can see blue and, and red uh, uh, lines there. And the blue and red lines, in fact, refer to polymers, right? The blue is the outer shell, OK? And this outer shell is a hydrophobic polymer. It's not only a hydrophobic polymer, but you need to understand that this has to be transported into the body. So it has to be a polymer that has got stealth characteristics. In the French jargon, I like the term furtif, meaning stealth. And uh, so we have to engineer that, that sort of polymer so that it, is, it has got stealth characteristics. Now inside the red part, you've got another polymer, which is now a bio degradable polymer. We call it uh, hydrophobic. It doesn't like water. Whereas the red one is hydrophilic. It likes water, obviously, because it has to be transported into the body, and the body contains more than 70% of water. So uh, we need to have amphiphilic, both hydrophilic and hydrophobic polymers, and this is the kind of mycels we work with. Now, interestingly, if you look at how we get to the micelles, you find that, well, the first thing we have to do is to get to the polymers. 
So we have to go to the lab, get the polymers. Once we get the polymers, then we put them into solution in water. Take the polymers, put them in water. Nature does the rest. That is, these polymers, which are linear, will self-organize, self-assemble into my cells. That's nature. We're not intervening into that process. And they self-organize. Now, the next step, as I told you, is to put in drugs in there. The green spots you see are the drugs that we've put inside. Now, people may say that, well, these are designs. These are sketches. These are drawings. But let me show you this one, right? This is a transmission electron microscopy image okay, of those nanomycels. You see an image where you see a lot of dark spots, spherical dark spots. The spherical dark spots that you see there, in fact, refer to those nanomycels. And as I told you earlier, they are in the range of about 100 to 300 nanometers, right? So that's an interesting part. We can also move to more complex structures. We can have nanomycels with hydrophobic and hydrophobic layers and hydrophilic layers, but we can also have more sophisticated and, and more uh, interesting structures where we have not only hydrophilic, but we can have dual hydrophilic, two hydrophilic, and a hydrophobic. So it gets a little more complicated, but very interesting, because in such kind of, of, uh, of structures, we can put not only one, two, three drugs. We've done it. We can put three drugs. And just imagine the complexity of cancer. One drug alone doesn't work. You need many drugs, right? So you can put more drugs. And let me show you again this transmission electron microscopy image. So you see, we have the design, and then we go to the lab, do it, and then check it on the microscope, and we say, we got it. Yeah, we got the structure. And it's a transmission electron microscope. It's not an optical, normal microscope. So this is not uh, an image we can do here in Mauritius, but we sent to our colleagues who generously uh, generate this for us, and so we're happy. Now, once we have got those structures, we put in drugs. Now, you can believe that your, that your drugs are inside, but as scientists, we always need to verify and always need to check whether they're really there. There means in the inner core. Remember, I told you the drugs, the green spots you saw earlier should be in the inner core. And indeed, you find this image, it's a microscopy image again, and you see the drugs. You can see the micelle, and you see the drug in the inner core. There they are. So you confirm that your drugs indeed will be into the inner core of your uh, nanoparticles. You can put one drug, but you can put also two drugs into a micelle. Uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, we, we've done it for not only cancer, but we've also done it for TB, tuberculosis, and where we can put uh, one or two drugs. So uh, it's getting more, uh, more interesting. Now, once you put in the drugs, the next step is to ensure that your drugs will be released. Because put the drugs there, you've got very nice nanoparticles, you get a publication out of it, you're very happy, but are you releasing the drugs? Yes, you are. Look at this. The drugs can be released in different modes. The release kinetics, right, as we call them, depend on the micelle structure. This is one aspect. Second aspect, it depends on the type of drugs that we use. So we have various parameters to control the kinetics of release of the drugs into the body, right? So, we, so there you can understand why we put a lot of, of, of emphasis on, on structuring those micelles, because ultimately they will impact on uh, the release kinetics. We can also load into nanovesicles. I told you earlier, we can have combinations of those. There are here different types of anti-cancer drugs. I've shown you one graph where we can have one anti-cancer drug, which is 5-fluoruracil, very potent anti-cancer drug. And you can see on this graph that the 5-fluoruracil is being released at a faster rate 
than the gemcitabine. The gem here refers to gemcitabine. Those two molecules are very, very important drugs used for pancreatic cancer. Now, the idea is that if the cell sees one drug, right, the drug does its effects. And then, immediately after, the cell sees another drug, which also is doing its effects. So it's like you're bombarding the cells with drugs. So this is the kind of idea uh, that we have. We bombard the cells with different drugs and see what happens. So uh, the, the, this uh, graph shows you that, indeed, we can do it. We can put in... We, sorry. Uh, we, we can put in anti-cancer drugs that are synthetic, right? I mentioned a lot of those uh, synthetic drugs. But we can also, because we are living in the Indian Ocean, we have a lot of biodiversity, so we should not neglect also the biomolecules that we can have. We have, for example, one of them is artemisinin. Artemisinin is a drug of choice for, to combat malaria. But we also found that artemisinin can have extremely interesting anti-cancer properties. So, why not try to put artemisinin into our nanoformulations, combine them with anti-cancer drugs, and see what we can do? So, all these uh, different combinations are quite interesting. And we do this with our partner uh, uh, in, in Madagascar, Baroness Company. Now, you've done all this. You've got your drugs, you can release them. Now, you need to check whether, once you've released the drugs, they are indeed active and they're indeed cytotoxic, that is, killing the cancer cells. We checked it. We used human pancreatic cell lines. We call this in vitro testing. So we tested the efficacy of our system on cell lines. What we note is that indeed we have, we are killing many more cells, much more than if we had conventional drugs. So we're killing cells. Well, we hope we can do that, right? Also, the killing of the cells will be even more important if you bring in more of those myocells into your body. But we have a limit. We can't go beyond the toxicity of, uh, of the drugs to your body. So we're limited by that. Now, once you've done that, the question is, why does the nanomyocells kill more cancer cells? Right? The question is, if we have nanomyocells that are more effective, they must be getting into the cells. Now, we prove on this microscope image that indeed those nanomyocells, they can get into the cells. You can see here on this image, you can see we've used a dye just to, just to model. We've used a dye molecule, and it's a red dye. You can see the dye accumulating around the nucleus. It's in the cytoplasm, right? Into the cell, in the cytoplasm, accumulating around the nucleus. That's one point. But you can also have one more image where this, now this dye molecule not only is in the cytoplasm, but gets into the nuclei. So that's very important. So we, we have better efficacy because of that. Now, the last, uh, uh, I would say, uh, the moment of truth, if you like. When we started, we thought that by playing with the myocells and combining them and using more drugs and so on, we could get better results. Here we are. If you look at this, at this graph, you can see that at most, if you use combinations of two drugs, you can reach 60, 70 percent, or in other words, 30 percent of killing of cells, right? If you use nanomyocells, you can reach around, let's say, 70 percent of killing of cells. If you combine nanomyocells that contain drugs, put them together, you can reach around 90 percent of killing of cells. So that's where we are. 
We're very excited with this, with this result. But now, of course, testing on cell lines is one thing. We need now to go higher. In other words, we need now to go in vivo. In vivo means testing on animals. This small presentation on our work, there's a lot of people behind. This is the team working there. And uh, this team is very motivated. We've got the will. This is our way. Thank you.